you know, I think the absolute key takeaway for us is to say um, there are some astonishingly attractively priced assets. We're going to look back and, and say um, that this was a once in a generational opportunity to kind of be long risk assets. Um, you know, you, the, this is the time to kind of be courageous um, and to hold on to your risk assets. Selling them now into cash, that will be permanent capital destruction in our view. Afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us in another Prudential podcast. Uh, I'm Christo Gea, Head of Business Development, and chatting this afternoon to my colleague David Nee, our Chief Investment Officer, trying to make some sense of the market moves of the last few weeks. David, gosh, what a month. What a month indeed. Did you ever think in your investing career following the global financial crisis that you would be experiencing these conditions? Look, I, you know, I'm older than I look and my career has kind of spanned a long time. Um, you know, I saw, you know, the crash of the Japanese stock market and the dot-com bust and then, you know, obviously the GFC. Um, but I think what's been astonishing about this is just um, the unexpected um, nature and the rapidity with which kind of events have unfolded with some of the most rapid market price action and increases in volatility yeah. since, uh, you know, the Great Depression in the 1930s. It's obviously a, clear, a major event for investors and in fact for, the, for Homo sapiens. Uh, it may have some positive spin also for, for Mother Earth, uh, time will tell. Um, just as an investor, how do you think about the opportunities? How do you think about um, responding to the incoming deluge of information? Sure. I mean, look, we live in a world now where kind of information overwhelms us on a, on a daily basis. And, um, you know, asset managers are never going to be, you know, experts in, um, you know, the spread of a virus and, and, and what effect that's going to have. So, you know, you know, our process at Prudential is one where, you know, we seek to kind of exploit, um, I think, the fear which inevitably arises in these kind of events. And, and, and you see that, you know, whether that's kind of in panic buying of toilet rolls or it's in pan panic selling of stocks and bonds. Um, and so, you know, we try and be, you know, as tough as it sounds, kind of as unemotional as we can about what's being presented to us in terms of market prices. But, um, you know, clearly it, it, it's not easy. Nobody knows how long this is going to continue. The global economy feels like it's coming to a full stop. You know, there are real um, kind of hard issues that are going to come and hit companies. You know, anyone that's got debt and still has expenses to pay, you know, clearly you've, you've got some potentially major problems there if your balance sheet is currently stretched. Um, so that does lead us into th thinking about what sort of companies you might want to be exposed to. Um, but in, you know, in terms of, um, I think, how we proceed from here, you know, Prudential's are applying its valuation process that actually has kind of worked through all of those crises that I talked about before. Um, you know, it is worth kind of bearing in mind, you know, even if we cast our minds back to the 1987 kind of market crash in developed markets where, um, you know, the S&P fell 20% on one day, that actually over the calendar year 1987 markets were up. So, you know, it feels disastrous and we can't see our way through it, but we think that we've been presented with a once in a generational opportunity to buy some incredibly cheap assets. Uh, David, zooming in on the SA market, of course, mm. which is the, the bulk of our uh, South African clients' portfolios, um, the the narrative seems to be that in uh, globally that there's really a, a liquidity or liquidity issues that have driven a lot of the perhaps even automated uh, sell, short selling etc um, were similar factors at play in the SA market in your view look i mean south africa is unusual in in an emerging market context in that we have essentially a, a kind of developed market structure for our financial market um, and um, probably the most liquid emerging market in the world um, and, and, and so it is natural that I think where, where investors do find themselves wanting to reduce risk appetite, that they come to places where they can actually find liquidity. Um, and, um, you know, when we, and we see that in other asset classes as well. Uh, I mean, it has been a, a very peculiar last couple of weeks, I guess, in global markets in that, for instance, we've seen US bond yields rising rapidly. You know, in, in any other circumstance, one would have always said, you know, US bond yields are a safe haven asset. And in this kind of environment, they would be falling like a stone. And you can't say, well, why is that? Why have they been going up? And obviously, we don't know for sure, 
But I think one possible answer to that is that you have seen this kind of leveraged um, uh, uh, plays um, having to unwind and people seeking liquidity. You know, US Treasury market, probably the most liquid asset in the world after cash. Um, and similarly, some of that has probably fed to into markets like South Africa. But you've also seen, to be fair, some very kind of sharp and price action in, in other emerging markets too, which, which don't offer our kind of liquidity. So it does appear um, that there's this kind of generalized risk off um, and, um, and that's led to some, in our view, some kind of valuation opportunities um, that uh, you know, we probably haven't seen in South Africa um, since um, the apartheid years. Uh, from a price to book perspective, the South African market appeared cheaper than global markets mm. prior to all of these events. So certainly there, there didn't appear to be any buffer, any margin of safety. Well, in terms of the market move, it's certainly true that you know, the valuation difference between the South African market and global markets hasn't helped you. So you know, as this kind of unfolded, South African equities were trading roughly on a one and a half times price to book. So the price of the equity is relative to the book value of, um, uh, of the company's assets. Um, you know, the global markets were trading on a price to book of, of closer to two and a half. So, you know, that did look like a very big gap relative to history. And um, in, in an ordinary kind of regular cyclical downturn, we would have expected that valuation buffer to protect the, the returns of the South African market because you know, the low price to book already suggested that there was a lot of kind of bad macroeconomic news priced into South African equities that wasn't in global equities. But what we've actually seen is that, you know, South African markets fallen just as much as, as global markets have and such that, you know, we're now um, uh, looking at a price to book on our market of around one, which is, um, you know, probably 20% below where we got to in the global financial crisis. And we know what happened after that. You know, our market then went up 30% a year compound for five years. Um, so, you know, the prospective returns from here look incredibly enticing. The uncertainty about how long it will last, how big an effect it'll have on companies, who will be the survivors and who will be the losers. Um, you know, we can see those stresses um, in the South African market and in global markets. You know, one can look at the US high yield market as a kind of bellwether um, of, uh, uh, you know, of, of, of companies and sectors, um, all the usual suspects under massive pressure, hotels, um, uh, energy, Airline. uh, airlines. Uh, I mean, just, um, yeah, you, you know, if people aren't traveling, if they're not flying, um, if they're not renting cars, um, then, yeah, you, you obviously um, are going to see um, a, a kind of full stop coming in those companies' earnings. And the question then is, is, this, is it going to be a six week stop or is it going to be a six month stop? And, you know, some companies may not survive. Um, but, you know, that said, I mean, the US in particular has already announced a whole raft of measures that are going to be designed to support um, a lot of those industries that are most hard hit. Maybe the fact that Trump owns some hotels himself might incline him to, um, to do something to help the hotel industry. But no, I mean, seriously, um, you know, they, you know, whether that's initially giving some debt for kind of forbearance um, or ultimately injecting equity um, into, into some of these um, companies, as we saw in the GFC, into banks. You know, South Africa's not there yet. Um, in terms of announcing those measures, but it does feel like, you know, we obviously we had the Reserve Bank announcing its rate cut, One, the government departments coming and saying they're going to start deploying some cash for small and medium sized enterprises. But, you know, I think we're just kind of running a little bit behind the global schedule um, because coronavirus came here later. So, you know, but it's well, I, I think it's not unreasonable to suspect that, you know, our kind of playbook is going to follow what we've seen elsewhere. Um, you know, but with a little bit of a lag. Um, it certainly does seem like a buyer's market, uh, the South Af Africa in particular. Um, you and your investment team colleagues, how are you guys currently thinking about, guys and girls currently thinking about uh, specific asset classes? Yeah, I mean, everywhere you look, obviously, you know, assets look cheap. Um, uh, you know, if you start with what we would regard as a safe haven asset, South African government bonds, um, you can lend money 
now to the South African government for 20 years at a nominal yield of 12%. You know, inflation just printed this week um, at 4.6. So, you know, you're looking at a you know, real yield there prospectively of close to 8%. Um, you know, that's an extraordinary prospective return. Um, inflation linked bonds, government bonds that um, are, are explicitly linked to inflation, offering you a real yield of 5% guaranteed, 5% real yield, um, which again, you haven't seen since um, probably 2001 in those assets. Um, you know, and then if you look into equity, we've touched on kind of the market, the price to book of one, um, you know, you look across stocks, there are many stocks within the market that are now trading on low single digit um, PE multiples, um, which uh, again, you can say these are kind of decent companies um, that yes, are exposed to the South African macroeconomic story, but you know, if you can potentially, I mean, we'll look at that asset and kind of say, well, you know, why is it, why is it trading on a, on a PE of three? Um, you know, there, there surely must be some value there. Now, obviously on stock selection, I mean, my colleague Ross Biggs in one of the other podcasts that um, you'll be able to watch um, has talked much more about equities um, and clearly one does need to be careful to make sure that, that you're identifying the companies that are generally going to be, genuinely going to be able to survive. Um, and, and that does at the moment necessitate kind of stronger balance sheets. And I think that's the, the you know, the work that that, that equity teams and analysts kind of are doing and that we're doing here at Prudential to ensure um, that, um, you know, that those companies that have been derated but still have decent balance sheets and, 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 and long-term business, kind of good business prospects um, are, are represented in our portfolio as overweight positions. Um, I don't know the triple for Annus Horribilis, but uh, the property sector's woes continue. Sure. Um, yeah. No, look, I mean, the, again, I think there um, the, the, the key is going to be stock selection. There will be some property companies that are not going to make the cut. Um, and, you know, they may even find themselves in a situation you know, now that they won't be absorbed by another company. You know, growth point is not going to necessarily come to the rescue of some of the smaller players that are trading on what appear to be very attractive yields. You know, the, the, I mean, in some cases, high yields are simply telling you that the market doesn't believe the earnings um, are going to be coming through. Um, you know, there are huge challenges in the retail industry, you know, from, you know, quarantine, isolation framework. Um, and unfortunately, you know, the, the narrative there was already very challenging, given South Africa's had the best part of a decade of slowing macroeconomic growth. Um, so we'd seen SA retailers, particularly those that are kind of in general retail and fashion, um, taking massive pressure on margins um, and looking for landlords to bear some of their pain. Um, and, um, and, and that story is, is just going to be um, exacerbated by, um, you know, the coronavirus episode. Um, yeah, so with, within property stock selections, definitely going to be key. Um, again, we've been focusing on, you know, the, the, the stronger players and, and avoiding those um, where we have kind of genuine concerns. Um, you know, some of those companies, uh, I mean, Redefine as an example, um, you know, in our calculations, that stocks current leverage is over 50 percent of um, uh, loan, to, loan to kind of value of its assets. Um, you know, and those asset values may well fall in this kind of environment and, and, and that that could cause some very significant stress. So, um, you know, that would be a stock where I think we would have some concerns. Um, you know, and it is also as an asset class, I think the, the, the uncertainties about the fundamental outlook for property have been a reason why, um, from an asset allocation perspective, we've been underweight property. And as property as an asset class has fallen in the, uh, this year, we haven't kind of continued to, to add. We've let that property rate shrink in the portfolio. Um, and been preferring to add equity and bonds um, where we see a greater likelihood of achieving superior returns going forward. Uh, David, um, are there any particular um, portfolio changes that are beginning to you know, be, be discussed amongst the team? Uh, in particular, again, I guess uh, specific um, buying opportunities that are percolating to the top? 
Look, our process is one where, you know, as assets become cheaper, we um, will want to lean into that valuation. Um, and, um, you know, and we've, it has worked very well over long periods of time, but clearly patience is, is, is critical in that. Um, so, you know, as equities have fallen, we've been keen to add to equities incrementally. Um, and that's also been true in, in, in adding to, to, to nominal bonds as those yields have suddenly kicked up. You know, in some cases, you know, we've seen yields rise by, you know, 200, 250 basis points um, to yeah, levels that... The ones in know, a career. No, absolutely. You know, to, to levels that hadn't been seen you know, since the early, you know, the, the, the early noughties. Twice in a career. Yeah, a turn of this decade. But obviously, bear in mind then, back in 2001, inflation was 8%. Inflation's now 4 and yield, you're being offered the same nominal yield. So, you know, the prospective real yield is far higher now. So, you know, we've been incrementally adding to that. We've deployed, um, you know, some further cash that, um, where portfolios had liquidity available, um, particularly into bonds. Um, and um, you know, as I say, we've kind of allowed the property part of the portfolio to, to, to shrink a little bit um, as uh, uh, given our uncertainties about the earnings outlook for the, for the sector as a whole. The offshore portion of our multi-asset portfolios are managed by our colleagues at MNG sure. Investments. Uh, any idea what sort of areas are look, looking attractive? To them? Yeah, I mean, um, actually, if we kind of circle back a little bit and just talk about South Africa versus offshore, um, you know, uh, I think to reiterate comments by some of my colleagues, um, you know, the RAN does look very cheap, um, probably, um, you know, certainly as cheap as it was in, in, in the Nenegate situation. And, and bear in mind, you know, the returns post Nenegate in South African assets were fabulous, you know, as the RAN depreciated. So, um, you know, we, at, at an asset allocation level, we have been looking to bring, you know, some of our exposure in offshore assets, which has obviously been increasing as, as the RAND has done poorly and, and the South African assets have also um, uh, performed poorly, um, that um, we've brought some of that, that back into South Africa um, and been happy to kind of deploy that as, as, uh, as I intimated earlier into, into equities and bonds. Um, within the global part of the portfolio, um, you know, I think the, the, the recent price action, you know, is inclining them to, um, you know, to look at um, developed market equity um, as, as an attractive option there. Um, you know, previously, you know, we, we had been focusing on perhaps some of the high yielding emerging markets where given the developed markets, particularly the S&P had looked expensive. So we'd been happy to kind of be underweight um, the US equity market into some select emerging. And I think what's changed is that, you know, some of those developed markets, um, maybe particularly the European markets have, have been looking, uh, I think after this market move um, to offer really, um, uh, I think attractive long-term value. The S&P looks to us, you know, to be fair, it's had a huge derating. You know, you've gone from a 19 forward PE to a 14, um, uh, but it doesn't look really cheap. Whereas some of those markets now are pretty much as cheap as they were in the global financial crisis. Thank you very much, David. Uh, fascinating insight as always. Um, we hope that our viewers enjoyed that and we look forward to continuing the conversation in the coming weeks.